All right, so Frederick wants to be our friend. So we're going to accept that. Um, in Civ 6, in Civ in general, mostly Civ 6, having a friendship is as good as defeating someone, if that makes sense. As long as you're a declared friend, they cannot attack you, and they will not. And the way the AIs work is that if you get an initial friendship, it's pretty easy to maintain, unless you've got a lot of negative warmonger penalties and things like that. This, like, plus 12, I'm pretty sure is a friendship. One of these. Um, that helps you basically maintain the friendship. So it's like, pretty much, with the exception of if I get a bunch of warmongering bonuses, this guy will never attack me the entire game. If I played peacefully the entire game, as long as I didn't like ruin both his agendas, he's as good as non-existent. Yes, he's another player who's trying to win, but in terms of my survival, if he was my only neighbor, you could literally build no military and you will never die. And that's really important to know because it's really, it's a big question um, as to how much you want to invest in military. He hates people who are at peace. Which means he's going to hate us. But hopefully he's busy with this war. Until we are ready. Alright, so we're going to crank out a couple of builders. we got our trader here. So, we're going to go ahead and queue this up. Iron, baby. So, I'd really like to be able to purchase this tile here. Which is 40 plus 60, so only 100. So, I could do that right now, but I'd like to get a trader first. Because that's a very powerful economic boost. Uh, especially in your auxiliary cities. Like, your first expansion starts off very weak. But you can buff it up with an internal trade route, um, which Persia, of course, gets a, boast, a uh, boost to. Now, I'm not sure if I said this at the beginning of my first part of this of this series, and I apologize. But if you want an overview of um, like my opinions on Persia in general, um, go back and watch like the first five minutes or whatever of my original Persia video. Which, yeah, admittedly, they're not amazing videos, whatever. <laughs> I'm doing what I can. Um, and, you know, you don't have to, I'm just saying, it, like, what I do in that video, part one of my first Persia City, uh, Persia video, is I talk about the Civ in general. And I don't want to go over that again, because I already have uh, posted that. Um, in general, I think they are very powerful, very solid Civ. Not OP, but very strong. Let me see here. I think I'm going to get this second amenity. Man, I keep forgetting about the, uh, the costs associated with um, quick being faster. I was like, oh, I need uh, 180 gold for a trader, but it was only uh, however much you just saw. Less than that. So I think this will grow. This, not actually, this won't actually be 15 turns. It'll be much shorter because uh, this will grow in four turns, get another production. It'll grow again after that. Question is... You know, you can never really have enough builders. That's a fact. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and, and uh, use the builder boost while we have it. Rather than... Like, nothing else I could build in this city right now is, is that great. The, the best other option would be Monument. Which is admittedly uh, often what I consider the most important thing to, to get first is a Monument. 
but and that's because you really want to start ramping up the uh, border growth for example like level one, one population it has 0.3 culture and takes 20 turns just to get one tile so getting but once you get just the two culture from the monument it goes much much faster so you want to kind of get that rolling um, as quickly as you can so <clears throat> Yes, it's good to get a fast monument, but builders are the most important thing in general. <laughs> so, Granada, I can get a trade route with, and it'll get me a point here. Ooh, Alcazars. I believe those are forts. That's actually interesting. I wonder what full. I haven't actually uh, used those this game. So, we'll see if that uh, that pans out. I would like to be uh, get get a envoys with them because I do intend to build uh, encampments. I'm gonna build one in Passagard. Very nice. Thank you for the gold, sir. Now I haven't sent him a delegation, and the kind of the thing is like. If you're close to being able to declare friendship with someone, the delegation can be the final like straw, the final like push to get them to actually like you. Um, but for the most part, mm, it doesn't really matter. Like he he declared friendship with us because of we satisfied his agenda. I'm not sure what this is, but we didn't need a delegation. And yeah, the delegation would show me these things. So if you really want to know, then that's an option. But at the end of the day, like, it's just a bit of gold that just does almost nothing, in my opinion. One, basically, the bottom line is, don't worry about delegation. They're not mandatory. Just keep in mind, it's a small diplomatic bonus is sending a delegation. And it'll give you one level of visibility, which situationally you want, but usually you don't bother. That's a bit sad. Oh my god, that could post that could end up being a problem for us. <laughs> Buenos Aires, I believe. Yeah, yeah, they have a they have a bonus to Yeah, yeah, they have a very strong bonus. Industrial uh, city states are very interesting because industrial zones actually aren't worth building Ex um, pretty much aren't worth building without industrial city-states and I'll get to the reason why later but it has to do with the fact that the cost of the industrial zone to build um, compared to the amount of its production you get from it. All right, we're going to send this over here. I don't think we need any more builders, so we're going to go ahead and get started on our encampment. Sadly, I really wanted to buy tiles. Yeah, I'm going to do that, actually. I need to buy a tile to build an encampment, but I want to do that with it with early empire land surveyors. So I'm going to wait and I'm just going to build something not quite as good in the meantime, but something I need eventually. So, uh, it's really good to maximize your bonuses whenever you can for whatever you're building, even tile buying. Although honestly, a lot of the time I don't bother with that card because it's so it's ultimately such a small amount of gold that is kind of meaningless. It's much better to have just buy that tile when you need it. But in this case, um, it kind of works out. I have to buy like three tiles too, so I think this guy might die. That's okay. I don't think these are spawning spawning. I could be wrong. <laughs> when 
what does that mean, right? Uh, I think they're just passively spawning rather than a scout came here and then is attacking my city. It'll passively spawn every like five to ten turns or whatever, one barbarian. Uh, but when it, the scout triggers it, it spawns like a bunch in a row. That's a problem. But uh, as long if it's just one, even if it kills my slinger, eh, I don't really give a damn. The reason being, I already have the archery boost, which I believe I found in a um, goodie hut. All right, let's get let's get shopping, baby. So we're gonna swap this in. Let's see. So, obviously, most important is the iron. And then I could put the encampment right here, but I kind of want to put it right here. Because that way it'll touch any districts I put in this area and uh, give them a small adjacency bonus. Plus, this is so in like a terrible spot in terms of defense. Honestly, in single player, encampments are rarely involved in actual like defense for you. Uh, I guess they can be. Depends. But generally, you're not building encampments <laughs> unless you're actually going to war. So, Oh, that's right. I need to bring one of these guys here. And so ultimately, uh, it doesn't really matter where you put the encampment. But this is like... Not nearly as useful as here, because it can kind of cover this whole side of both cities. If that did ever come into play. So basically my game plan is I'm going to get a one encampment. Get a barrack, uh, barracks there. And then just start pumping out immortals. I think I'm just gonna take care of this here, because I don't want that spawning anymore. I don't care if a like two health horseman runs around here; I can get rid of it eventually. Now this is taken care of because I'm just gonna boost this with my builder, one of these guys, probably this guy. I don't not even sure I need to finish this builder right now. Because he wouldn't have anything to, to work on. <laughs> Although he's so close that maybe I just should but finish it. Hmm. I could try for hanging gardens. Feels kinda weak though. There's just better things to build. Hang gardens like if you happen to have actually seen one of my old videos, I did kind of uh, shit on it because it's very weak. It's kind of like seems way better than it really is in terms of the benefit it gets you. 15% growth, right? Hang on. I think writing is what we want. 15% growth, right? So that's 15% of four in this city. Which is like 0.5? No. 0.75? Something like that. <laughs> 0.7. And then it's 1 ish here. So, I mean, if you get it. Eh. Growth doesn't really matter, man. Like, getting like 0.7 food here would grow this, like, you get one turn faster. But there's just so many important things to build in the early game that it's pretty hard to justify hanging gardens. It's just my two cents. I might go for it, though. I mean... Because <laughs> the thing is, it can kind of comfortably fit into tech paths that you're getting going for anyway. Like, you're pretty much always getting irrigation, and you almost always have a uh, river. 
and certain certain points where like I could build a campus or I could try for hanging gardens. Okay, in that case, maybe it is worth it. All right, you go there. I realize I can still buy tiles, huh? Might as well. So it's going to grow to here. That's weird. I would rather it grow to these hills or these bananas here. That's quite nice. Oh yeah, monuments not as urgent because it gets a little bit of culture from the bananas. And that's enough. Just like plus one is enough to make the growth much more reasonable. Um, it's kind of glitching out on me here. It's not showing me where it's going to grow to. But it's uh, much, much, much faster than without this plus one. Because one little culture makes a big difference for a small city's uh, borders. Looks like another wonder went. Okay, that makes my life easier. There goes the hanging gardens. <laughs> so what I go for instead is a campus. Now, I'm kind of thinking of putting it here. Man, if only I can get this tile. Hmm. If I put it, uh, so it gets plus one science for every two jungle. And the thing about the problem with that specific adjacency bonus, the jungle bonus, is that you want to chop down your jungle. So it's like not a permanent thing. You're not going to chop down a mountain, so that's fine. Um, but the other situation where you don't chop down jungle is if you have something like bananas. Because you, there's no point in chopping down the jungle, because you can build a plantation anyway. So you might as well keep that plus food. And there's no reason not to. So bananas are what you would call like permanent jungle. Everything else I'm gonna want to chop away, with the like freak exception of getting like Chichen Itza, which virtually never happens on Deity because of its location on the tech path. Um, relative to how the the AI snowballs. The AI snowballs basically to where Chichen Itza is, and then you start to catch up. So at that point, they're the maximum ahead of you, if that makes sense. Um, so then it's really hard to build it yourself, but anyway. And I'm kind of thinking of plopping the campus here, because it, yes, it's only plus one, but it'd be only plus one here anyway. But I could eventually put I could put some districts here, and it could touch something that's here, like a like a theater square or something. Hmm. You know, I think I'm actually going to plop it right here, because it's still be plus one. I have some potential to put a commercial zone right here, and then maybe an industrial zone right here, because it would be touching mines. So that's like my vague plan. And I can chop this jungle right now. Um which is fine, so it'll boost boost this whole process. It's good to, um, it's obviously really important to think about those adjacency bonuses. Because that's what, it's an advantage that a normal campus wouldn't have. Like, if I just plopped it anywhere, if I, if I think about it, I can get an adjacency. That's just a plus one or two science that you wouldn't have otherwise. You'd have a city with a campus, or you can have a city with a campus and an adjacency bonus. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm being Captain Obvious right now, but really pay attention to those adjacency bonuses. But that said, there are plenty of situations where it's better to just be like, screw it, I'm just going to throw it right here. The main reason being a better spot is not available anytime soon, and you really want that district right now. Like, let's say there's a decent mountain spot right next to my capital, and then the best mountain spot is actually, like, three away, but I don't have any money. I'm not going to grow there anytime soon. I really need that campus. I mean, you can just slap that down. Um, I think the best example is holy sites. Yes, holy sites have adjacency bonuses for mountains and woods, but at the end of the day on DED, if you are going to get a religion, you have to put that down right now. You cannot wait till you like expand your borders three times 
to get the perfect holy site just for like one faith no 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 just throw that thing down buy a better tile if you can but just make sure you get that holy site up um, a similar logic i think applies to theater districts theater districts are weird because they get bonuses to wonders and it's really hard to plan your wonders often with certain exceptions like oh this is a good petra city i want to try to get petra i'm going to put it right there okay put a put a marker down now I'm going to put my theater district next to that. Good for you. But most of the time it's like, oh, I oh I got the tech for Rural Valley. Oh, oh, I could actually put it here. Okay, I'm going to go for it. But that's kind of a decision you make when you're near that tech, if you know what I mean. Um, that said, maybe as I or you um, get more experienced, you can do some extremely long-term wonder planning. Um, for the most part, you want to slap down that theater district right away because you're probably building theater districts so you can go for a culture victory. And you're getting culture victory by getting districts, theater districts, that give you... I'm sorry. That give you great writer and uh, etc. points. All right. Mm. So I could. Would be good to go up here, get apprenticeship. What I could also do is try to go for these guys, catapults. It's a bit of a toss up. I feel like apprenticeship is super powerful. I think I'm going to make that my goal here. If you're wondering, like, what should my default tech path be? Basically, at this point, you're going to want, okay, I've got my early game techs. Yeah, I'm not getting religion. I don't, I'm on the coast. Whatever. Go here. Commercial hubs are super powerful. They're probably equal to, can't, they're, or even better than campuses. Because um, of the amount of power that they give in terms of a trade route, plus gold, plus merchants which are very powerful, um, unique, uh, great people. But then the biggest thing is you actually have a pretty much a straight shot. If you get horseback riding and currency, you can very quickly get apprenticeship. And the actual reason to get apprenticeship isn't what you think. It's not industrial zones. Yes, you should build industrial zones um, situationally according to, um, according to uh, the amount of industrial city-states. But it's mostly this, which you can read. Plus one production to all mines. That's what you want. Most of the time, you're going to want to beeline that pretty fast. Because, uh, although, in this case, I'll only have one, two mines. But not even, as I'm sure as you know, most of the time you have more mines than this. Um, I will have more mines. And even that said, only um, three mines or two or whatever I'm at is still um, still makes it worth it. Because uh, plus one production per mine is just is just tremendously godly. Um, the alternative is if you're doing some warmongering, is to go up the bottom here. So yes, I've got, you're going to want archers 100% of the time, although I'm skipping it because I'm Persia. That's very, very unusual. Um, and let's say you got your starting text, whatever. Um, hey, I want to like snowball in terms of warfare. You go this way. You can get things like Terracotta Army, super powerful if you get that early on. Or if you get that after you build your army, it can be super powerful. Catapults are really on, are, are usually necessary for killing cities of any substantial size that have walls. We're trying to go fast enough that the cities don't get very powerful, but eventually we will need catapults. And of course, crossbowmen are uh, pretty fast up the track tree if you go straight here. And of course, they're tremendously powerful. They're the best unit of the medieval era. 
or um, they're the range unit of their era, which makes them very godly. That said, I mean, I'm kind of procrastinating here because I'm trying to share um, advice here about the tech tree. At the end of the day, though, there are several options. There are plenty of decent options. Like, there's a lot of godly things you can get here. You can go for Petra, although at this point I think we should have, if I wasn't targeting it, um, I'm sorry, what I'm trying to say is, if at this point you've teched here, you're not rushing it fast enough. Like, you don't want bronze working, you don't want, like, hanging gardens, probably, depends. Uh, you should really rush Petra if you're going to build it at all in your capital, because it's it can be hard to get on Deity, but it's possible if you rush it. Um, so Petra, you could rush Mines, as I said, which is often really powerful. You can rush Crossbows and uh, Terracotta. Uh, you can rush Knights, which is very interesting. Knights are very, very powerful. They're kind of freakishly easy to get because all you have to do is go horseback riding into Knights. And that's a pretty good um, like rush strategy you can go for, rushing Knights. Because they're very powerful units, so you can get faster than than like the deep, than most of your tech tree will catch up to. Um, so that can be a really good way to catch somebody by surprise, especially in like multiplayer. But then again, if you have a lot of things on the coast, you can actually just bum rush cartography from shipbuilding, which is insane because it's classical era, all the way up to renaissance era and then frigates which are super powerful if you actually rush cartography and square rigging and your opponents have coastal cities you can just go on a rampage on the water but of course if you're neglecting all this stuff you're very very your infrastructure suffers tremendously and you don't have a strong land military so lots of interesting choices to be made that said, if you don't want, don't know what to do, just go right here. Just get, just get mining. Just do it. Very safe. On single player, multiplayer takes more. Con you have to be more conscientious about how powerful your opponents are and what they're taking. Anyway, enough rambling. So I don't. I'm gonna take off state workforce because I'm gonna finish that uh, soon anyway. Military tradition is very important because. Mostly because it gives you flanking and support bonuses. So you're going to want to have those unlocked by the when you go to war. Um, the general card can be very good for getting an early general. Let's check out the great people tree. So nobody's getting one yet. Um, which means we have a good shot when we finish our encampment to get the first general. Which is pretty cool. Um, that makes a huge difference. You know, it's funny. Um... I sort of forgot something. <laughs> um, something about Persia. Although I guess it doesn't really matter at this point. But um, <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is uh, Persia, one of their unique abilities is that you get a movement bonus for declaring surprise wars. And in the ancient era, and when you're Persia, also the classical era, you get no penalties for declaring surprise wars. And the reason that's significant, uh, but I'm sorry, in terms of diplomacy and war weariness, you don't get any penalties. And so the reason that's significant is that if you meet a sieve that's nowhere near you, just blam, just declare a surprise war on them instantly. And then all your units will just get a free movement bonus for no cost to you. Your scouts will move really, really fast. Um, your builders will move fast, your settlers will move fast, your, your small army for killing barbarians will move very fast. I actually, um, I didn't do that this game, which was totally my, my mistake. But normally, I would highly recommend doing that as Persia. It's sort of a gimmick that uh, Persia can, uniquely can do. So let's say I met, um, I don't know, Victoria. She was over here. She is not going to hurt me. I'll just click Declare Spies War, and bam, my scouts are like rocketing around the map, which really helps in the early game. 